Hi, I'm Chris from Air Windows, and what I'm going to be doing here today is working on uh, my electric guitar. And this is also a bit of a test because I'm testing out a way of doing video for people. And I'm going to see how that goes. So I'll show you what I've got here is a Strat copy with two humbuckers. These are lace aluminum tone humbuckers. They're sort of like low impedance humbuckers. The way they work is uh, kind of unusual. This metal framework is actually a coil. It's one turn of wire each. And the way it works is we've got this little transformer thing that goes around the one turn of wire. And a uh, wire inside the transformer steps it up to guitar level. It's a kind of a neat thing. I think that it's sort of like um, old Grateful Dead tones or something like that. Um, wired up like this with the uh, orange wire serving as hot means that it is a relatively high output compared to there's another wire that you can use that will make it more low impedance. But it still gets this sort of you know, custom pickup kind of sound. It's a little bit more bland, but it's also a little bit more clean and it's nice and quiet. So what I'm going to be doing is wiring this up because I needed to. I uh, had it wired up with this pickup to this knob and this pickup to this knob, but then in assembling it, uh, the, the pot got broken. So I did need to take it back apart and replace that, and I thought I would change it. And here's what I'm working on with that. I'm going to have your one volume control and one tone control. And this is a fender switch. It's not quite like a Gibson switch because what it has inside is a little different. It has three connections for each side. Now you can see the uh, the output wire here is already wired to this point. This is the output wire for the other one. I've bent down the stuff that doesn't connect. And you can see kind of how it works that um, this is all the way over to the neck pickup. And if you connect this wire Here, let me try to get my fingers so that you can see what I'm doing. If you're connecting this through um, and the output wire goes to here, because this is the common one, you may or may not be able to see, but this goes to the, the inner part and this outer part connects to either of these. The neck pickup connection will hit here or hit here, but not both, or will hit there. And then if it's all the way over to the bridge, this is not connected to anything. So what I'm going to do is first wire up the remaining bit. And I'm going to take my needle nose pliers and squish it because I like having a, a good solid uh, connection. This is a nice uh, prequel for other soldering iron type things. I'm going to be expecting people to learn how to use a soldering iron. Notice how I did that. I touched the soldering iron to this part and then I touched the solder elsewhere on it. You don't touch the solder directly to this thing. It's not like you touch it and melt it onto the thing. You heat the thing up and then melt it. I'll be pointing that out, I think, repeatedly. So that's now connected, and I'm going to pull this clear to make sure that it's not contacting any of these other parts. I have a special trick in mind for this, and it'll be interesting to see how, how that goes over. But before I do that, I think maybe what I'll do is curl this down under here, 
I'm told that I have a Bob Ross kind of thing going on, and I admit I'm exaggerating that a little bit, but I'm also exaggerating that because this particular rig has the camera right next to my face, so I can't actually raise my voice or I'll blow the camera up. So it all kind of works out. Everybody will enjoy every part of it. I'm going to run this through here. This already has lots of solder on it, so what I'm going to... Back you go. In this case, I'm going to try to melt the solder on this and then feed the wire through the hole in that place and sort of tightening the wire up a little bit and let's see whether we can make this there. Now the way I'd like to do this is since I've made a hole and been able to run the wire through I want to get in here and twist it around in such a way that it's kind of squished up against the middle part rather than just being squished up against other solder because what I don't really want to do is have it floating around and the wire is in this bath of solder that is connected to the part. I'd rather have more of a mechanical connection if I can. And now I'm doing the same thing. I'm heating it up and feeding the solder in elsewhere. You'll notice that didn't take all that much. In fact, you can still see the hole in the potentiometer. A potentiometer is this device here. It's a resistive track and a little wiper. In some ways it's not unlike this device, which is the switch that connects here, moves continuously, and has a wire that connects through to one of these. The potentiometer, the moving part that connects either way is in the center and there's a little wire that touches on a resistive track that goes around in a circle. So if you turn it all the way up, which would be clockwise in this direction, and clockwise in this direction means that you flip it upside down and it's going around that way to turn up, meaning you connect this bit in the center to this bit on the edge when it's at full crank. Now remember that the bit on the edge and the bit in the center both also connect to this because that is still connected by the resistive track. Usually if there's any break in the resistive track that means your device is broken and it's not going to work very well. And this is another thing. Um, Stratocaster guitars will tend to have a 250k pot, 250 kilo ohms or 250,000 ohms. And Gibson guitars will tend to have 500k pots because the pickups on each of these things have different uh, impedances. And I'm <laughs> lots of lots of language, lots of language. I'll see what I can do as far as making it make some kind of sense. Uh, impedance is how many windings are in the coil, either this coil in here or the coil that wraps around the pole pieces and stuff, um, all the language. And some of this is going to be easier to understand if you have a bit of experience building stuff, but I'll see if I can't continue to do a little translation as I go. In any case, the potentiometers, the volume controls and tone controls and things, it's good when they sort of match the size of the pickups. If you have a Stratocaster pickup and a 500k pot, it'll sort of turn on more, the, the taper won't be right, it'll turn on more quickly. And uh, if you have a humbucking pickup with the higher impedance, more windings, I impedance is actually uh, Let's not get too heavy into this. Um, 
impedance is sort of the size of the pickup, the beefiness and, and weight and thickness of the pickup. And if you have the Gibson on a 250K pot or a, even a smaller pot than that, it'll be what you call loaded down too much. And that means that it will be overly dull. Like the, uh, the tone control, this is a little tone control. This is the output wire that goes out of the, the, the volume control potentiometer. And it goes to this capacitor, which is a 0 0.47 microfarads. Larger means more high frequencies and mid frequencies and such get through this thing and go to this other control. And the other control lets you roll things off to the point where if you, you turn it all the way down, then this connects right to ground. And ground is the body of these pots, and ground is this part and this part, all of these things. You touch it and the, the buzz goes quiet and you may zap yourself if you're using a badly wired tube amplifier. Ground is, ground is worth being concerned about. But uh, ground is also what you run high frequencies to using this. Now I have a special trick going on with this one. But first what I'm going to do is, before getting this little control out, and this is a 4700 picofarad, it's a tiny little capacitor. You can see it's not as big. And if I put this in this place, and it would fit right across too, if I put this in this place and rolled off the high frequencies using this, it would start at a higher place. It forms what you'd call a shelf, an equalizer shelf, meaning that if you got this size one, it might start at around oh, 3 kilohertz or something like that, around 3K. The K is different for the frequencies than it is for the resistors, but it still it means a thousand. And you're controlling basically how much of a roll-off you've got. Like, if this is your frequencies and this is your 3K, and you started rolling it off, then it would start doing this. And it would be loud here, and then it would start getting quieter. Or it would just, bloop, you'd wind up wiping it off. Now. Since this is not a fancy digital circuit, what you're actually going to get is more like that for rolling it partly off, or more like that for rolling it off completely. Analog filters don't do really sharp frequencies. They sound nice, but they don't really do sharp frequencies. You don't get to pick one note and go, OK, everything above this goes away. Instead, it's a more gradual thing. Now, let's see. Firstly, I had the intention of setting this up. And I'm going to double check that I've got the right control here. If it's pointed all the way back here like this, this is going to be my neck pickup. So I can look at the switch and see that this part is connected to here and then the middle will be connected to there. So here's where I'm going to want to control or connect the uh, one from this pickup. And I just want to see whether I can, there's two ways I could do that. One, I can try to melt it into a little fit through, or I can just start squishing it with my pliers here, and that'll also help it fit through. Because my idea is I want to put it through this, and then actually I have a better idea. We're going to put it up through here. And I have to start talking about happy little pickups, right? Do the full Bob Rossi thing. You can wire it however you want. No, I'm fooling. I'm just being kind of silly. 
And then what I want to do is poke this through this part here. So I'm going to want to take my needle nose pliers and twist it over just a bit. And that's probably going to be enough. I could try to take the pliers and crimp it around in a circle or loop it back, but I think this is going to be fine. Again, touching this and touching elsewhere on the connection. Now I have a bit of a trouble here. It's not a super big problem. Two things happened. One, I was pushing it down like this and I was pushing it against this wire insulation, which melted through. So this isn't going to do any damage, but it's worth noticing. I tried pushing it with my fingernail because my, my finger is fairly good at not getting hurt by hot, burny stuff. And it just made a hole in the insulation. So now that's exposed wire. It's harmless. It's not going to do anything wrong with the circuit that I'm making, but it's worth noting. And secondly, I kind of lifted up. I didn't mean for it to do that. That's why I was pushing down. So what I'm going to do this time, these are my little wire snippers. They're fingernail trimmers or cuticle trimmers, but I use them as wire snippers. And I'm going to close them up and push again. Since I've already melted it, I can melt it again. And now I'm pushing it just gently on the wire right where it connects to this part, because I want that metal to metal connection inside the solder. The solder is sort of holding it in place, but I'm not really enthusiastic about having just, you know, lead and tin and so forth solder. See, that's 62, 36, 2. I'm not sure you can get this anymore. It does work, but people try to avoid lead solder these days. And again, same deal. I'm touching both of these metal pieces. I'm touching them underneath. Also, you will find that when you heat up wire like this, it'll often make the wire sort of it'll often make the the insulation on the wire sort of try to draw back. And I've made my connection here, so this part hooks up. Now you'll notice that this has these two banks here. That's going to be useful for me. Rather than having it be just one in the center and like with a with a Gibson switch, what you have is your output is in the center. And then the switch mechanically lifts connections to either side. And then if you've got it uh, in the middle position, the switch connects to both of the sides. This isn't quite the same. This is a three position switch, but it doesn't overlap exactly. So the way that I do these two pickups is having them one on one side of the switch and one on the other side of the switch, because these are parallel switch connections. If you were doing a really simple wiring, you might want to wire the things so that um, all the connections go to both sides and it'll just make a more secure, reliable connection by having it uh, two switches at the same time. But I have something else going on. And this is the uh, secret. A Rickenbacker guitar at least the classic Rickenbackers in certain configurations have a little capacitor in series with the bridge pickup like this. So what that would be is if you had the output of the pickup and see how this capacitor is going from the output to ground. If you run it from the uh, I'm trying to stick this on here, even though I'm not going to permanently connect it. If you do this and you have the output of the pickup going through the capacitor to your switch, 
you'll be turning it on and off just the same as before, but instead of having the whole uh, pickup going through, the capacitor will only leave the high frequencies, and this is a smaller capacitor, so it's only going to do the very highest frequencies. And that's the way some of your old Rickenbackers are done. In fact, I can show you something interesting. This base is wired in the same way. I've got this pickup. I installed it in another video that I did a long time ago before I had a, a better way of, oh my god, recording these things. Forgive me. That is my, um, here, just give me a second. I have this filter on this thing, and it was being kind of done, and I'm going to just glom it on and hope that it will stay. I don't want that to fall off. Anyways, we'll see how that even works. I wanted to have that stay on. I had to do a lot of work to make this thing balance. I can even show that to you as well. Here, check this out. Long as we're doing weird crazy things. Here is the rig that I'm using. And you can see that you've got this little balancey thing. This is a gimbal. And it's keeping things steady and stable. And uh, one of the things I did is sort of disassemble what I had here so that it wouldn't be as heavy and so that it could balance on the gimbal better. And the gimbal is nice about keeping stuff stable. Unfortunately, my process of um, making the gimbal work, I think what I'll do is I'll fix this on the fly and then I'll get back to the previous work that I was doing because, you know, it's always something. You could see that I had a filter taped on here with electrical tape and I'm just going to get some more electrical tape and throw that on as well and then hopefully that will uh, survive the rest of this video. I'll figure out a better way afterwards. Trying to make the tape a little bit thinner. And I'm going to intentionally tilt this back for just long enough to put this on. It was meant to hold, but it really kind of didn't. I'm going to have to untape it to change focus. This little device does have autofocus, or it does not have autofocus, rather. I'm going to try to not wrench it around too much because the gimbal works on these little tiny motors, these little tiny robot motors, and if you're forcing it one way or another, it's only going to, like say, if I try to force it like this, sideways, it will only be constantly struggling to straighten itself out and then it'll burn out the motors if I let it. So we're not going to go there. As you can see, I still have it uh, nice and steadied. What we're going to do is go back to talking about these capacitors. If you run the bridge, capa the bridge pickup through a capacitor, that's kind of like what the uh, Rickenbacker has. And that's the thing I was going to show you over here. This is designed to work like it has a Rickenbacker wiring system in that this pickup is on this knob and it's a uh, Artec style Gibson. It's an extremely high impedance pickup. It's like 20, 25K, big, beefy, low frequency thing. Artec is still making those. That's good to know. That means you can get a Gibson e, uh, EB0 or EB style pickup very cheaply. This is a modified um, jazz bass pickup. 
It's a Squire Jazz Bass pickup. I took out some of the pole pieces. I stuck a uh, ceramic magnet underneath them all to sort of reinforce them and carved up the plastic and slid the whole thing to the side so that it has single pole pieces rather than double pole pieces. And then it goes through a capacitor. It goes through a capacitor just like what you'd get in a Rickenbacker tone circuit. And that's what this is what you get in the outside of it. So this control is the volume control, but it will only do the high frequencies from this. And then when you have both of them going on, um, there's a sort of phase shift thing that happens from having them be summed together in this way. And then this is a volume control. Well, I'm going to show you how that's done on a guitar and then very possibly even demonstrate the what you get, assuming it all works, which we hope it does. Firstly, we're not really quite doing it that way. This pickup has or this switch has some extra possibilities because it has two gangs. Like this is the bridge pickup, this is the middle where they would combine and that is the neck. Well, the thing is, I can see where they connect by going here. In this case, this is where it comes out. And I'll run the pickups into one of these two connections. And then this one is connected if it was on the neck pickup. So this one I'm leaving off. That means that if I put it all the way to the bridge, look closely in here, all the way to the bridge, I'm connecting to this point. And then on the middle, I'm connecting to this point, and this point's not connected. What that means is I can put this in here, or even sneak it through. It's not gonna, it's not gonna do any harm there and connect this directly to this point with the capacitor going from here to here. That means that if I'm on the bridge position, I have my humbucker style full crank just the way you'd want it. But then when I go to the middle position, I can go directly to that um, capacitor setting. This is no longer connected. You only get th through here and only the capacitor connects through to there. That makes three settings. One of them is bridge, one of them is neck, and one of them is middle with the bridge on that Rickenbacker style thing. And that is what I'm about to do. Quite looking forward to it, really, because I'm not sure I've ever tried this in a guitar. I've tried it in the bass, but I don't think I've tried it in the guitar. So the first thing I'm doing is wiring it through here so that I can make these connections. In fact, I may very well make all the solder connections at once. You know, one concern is I'm touching the wires a lot. That's not actually great. I know I'm having to connect down here, so I'm not touching that part, and that's better. But generally, if you were handling the wires a great deal, and as you can see, I'm trying to wrap it around this corner on the thing. And by that, I don't even mean touching with my fingernails. I'm talking about touching with my fingers because that has skin oils and things that'll get in the way of the solder. I could clip it with this. This is actually my guitar string clipper. But instead, I'm going to go for this, which is my printed circuit board connection clipper. When I'm building things like Sox boxes, I use one of these to snip off the ends of the bits ends of the parts. Now, sometimes I think I could do with these smaller needle nose pliers, just a tweezers to clamp things like this, but this will do. Okay, 
here I'm trying to push this through so that it's not off to the side but is actually connecting around this bit. It's a bit of the strain on my eyes actually. You may be able to see it with the, the close-up camera. I'm just squinching it through there so that I can make my mechanical connection that I always like to see. And here's where I get to put this one through. Let's see, coming up from underneath maybe? There's solder inside that wire connection, so it's not that easy to bend, but I'll do the best that I can. And again, you can touch the wire if you want to melt it, but you don't want to touch the solder to the wire. There, and I let that sort of scooch over because I figured it was going to contact the electrical parts anyhow. And again, touch to the thing. Another thing to bear in mind with parts like this, as you can see, bits of my plastic can melt easily. Like this, I was touching it and it melted the plastic off the wire just because I was pushing on it. Well, if you melt too much plastic around a part like a capacitor, it'll break. So you want to avoid heating the thing up like too crazy. I'm going to bend it back this way just so that I can tuck this guy in here. And then I'm going to see whether this switch will still work. Signs point to yes. Bridge, neck, and both but the bridge is on a capacitor. Now this guitar is now wired up. I'm not really using it in a high gain context, so I'm not being super worried about um, shielding the crud out of it because you know, you pick up some noise from these exposed wires, but you pick up a lot more noise from a coil that's just a single coil hanging out there. So when I'm, and also, when you have wires that are heavily shielded, there's also a capacitance to it. These have extremely low capacitance all throughout this because it's all point to point. And that's a, a trade-off that you make between um, shielding and getting nice low noise and getting this sort of old-school vintage sparkly bright tone going on. So what I'm going to do next, apart from shut off the um, soldering iron, oh, I'm also going to put these away because I can't. But what I'm going to do next is fire up an amplifier. And we're going to do a quick little seeing whether the pickups work without any strings on it. Because that's also something you can do. there. That's a recent acquisition. I've always worked on this. And here we have, as you can see, if you touch it, you're grounding it. The question becomes, does this work? Well, the volume works because you can hear the pickups, but let's find out.
these magnets are my pole pieces. That clearly works. That clearly works. And then that special middle position still clearly works, but the difference between these two is like this. And that's the difference between having a capacitor in the circuit or not. So I'm going to say that this wiring situation was a success. Oh, I better be careful with this though. Just a moment. So now what I'm going to do is throw the uh, screws back on here. This one screw wants the smaller screwdriver head. The reason I tested that out before putting the screws back in or the strings on is because that's kind of what you're going to want to do. It's not always that uh, certain that you're going to be able to make something like this and have it work every time. I was pretty fortunate this time in that it worked just fine, although I did not test the tone control. So let's stop for a moment and see what we got here. I think that was an effective tone control. And we'll continue. Mm, that one doesn't want to go in, so how about I do some of these other connections first. I was trying to put that in there and it was resisting a little bit. It was at a funny angle. This pick guard doesn't fit the uh, guitar body quite as well as it could. All of my stuff gets switched around like mad, so. You'll notice I don't have this on here, and there's a reason for that. Um, I can use this big old screwdriver head, which could produce lots of leverage and tighten it on and then crank it in really hard using all the leverage of this, you know, or extending it outwards so that you're cranking it on with this amount of leverage and pushing from over here. But all that's going to do is strip the wood. These connections in here, the screw connections, it's just wood inside. So if I turn it too much, it's only going to strip the threads. And that'll happen with any material, but it'll certainly happen with wood. And if I'm doing it from this angle, like I'm just turning against the shank of this, I can get a pretty decent sense of where it'll start to try to strip, where the resistance sharply increases. And having done that, we are pretty much all set. I'm looking forward to this. And then all I got to do is oh, grab my little tuner. My local, my local guitar store sells these, and I like them. I'm going to get this handy because this is my wire cutters. And I'm going to start putting the strings on. And you know, one thing I could do is, now that I don't have to be working over there, I can scooch over here and I can put on the strings with audio accompaniment. And that's what we're going to do. 
guitar might not sound all that awesome uh, right away because it wants to be tuned and get used to having the strings on, have them stretch out a little bit. I like attaching my strings kind of like this. Round over. I'm given to understand this is like the Martin twist. Martin guitars either used to or still do this. Now the thing you ought to be concerned about with that is it's really good at holding it on, but if you want it to wrap smoothly around the outside of the edge, you need to leave a little extra space, and I think I have not done that this time, so... The low note is going to be balancing on the thickness of a string out here. It's never going to actually be coming through and touching the... Uh, well, I can find out. Yeah, so what I was trying to do is getting it so that the string will come across and pull against the actual tuning machine rather than being balanced on the bit that I twisted around. I don't know whether I did that. If I didn't do it successfully, what that means is that the that string is going to be slightly more difficult to tune. Really, I want to leave a little more space. I'll demonstrate that the next time. We've gotten this through the wrong way. There we go. I took the tiny little springs out and back here because I didn't want them chiming and resonating, at least at one point. Honestly, that uh, could have been a mistake. I could put them back at some point. No big crisis either way. See, now this time, rather than scooch it up real tight and then twist it around, I'm going to leave more space. Same thing. Martin twist. This time, you see it tries to flip it over a little bit. This time you'll see that the uh, it turns around and goes on to the actual tuning machine. got two strings on it, we can actually do a little demo of what the pickups are like. Bridge only, neck only, Let's keep putting on strings. It'll be more fun with the high sparkly strings going on. Because remember, if I am lucky and I've done this properly, it's going to give me a nice uh, Rickenbackery jangle in that middle position only. And one downside to having these loose like this is that they're flopping around a little bit, but. No harm done. Okay, leave a little space so that it doesn't just get hung up on the corner. Martin twist, as I always like to do. It'll be quicker if I do a, uh, a string winder, but I don't have one of those handy. Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah, and I may say I didn't stre stretch this uh, A string in very much, so I'll do that now. You can even start getting it into the correct notes. can show you which would be rather fun. Let me get this other one on here and then I will show one of the secrets. Or maybe I'll put all of the strings on before doing it. That'll be amusing. This guitar has a big big secret and it's something I feel comfortable to reveal. Let's see. These guys are slipperier, so it's more difficult to do the Martin twist. I might not have the name of that right. It's from a guitar store uh, owner that I knew back in the 90s or so. I'd always call it that. You can also see that I have some pencil lead, pencil graphite, in the nut slots. One more, uh, two more actually. Now I can start hinting at what the secret of this guitar is. You'll notice that I own compressors. There's a analog man, orange squeezer, or whatever you juicer over there. And it sounds as if this is a compressed sound. It is not. There is no compressor on here. I'm gonna continue. putting these strings on like I'm supposed to do. By the way, one of the secrets of the amp here, this amp, um, the actual speaker cabinet is sort of covered with uh, towels. <laughs> It's muting it, but one of the reasons it has a bright, shiny tone is that it's also using a capacitor. I have a preamp stage and a power amp stage, and you're supposed to be able to connect them with just a direct connection, but I've got a place where there is a single capacitor and a resistor. I calibrated it just right so that the capacitor is um, letting through the high frequencies and then the resistor is sort of getting in the way. Upshot being that uh, you gotta be careful with these little tiny ones because they bite. If you have that capacitor on uh, just in line and then there is a resistor in there as well, you'll still get the sound through, but the highs will come through more easily because there's no resistor in the way of them. And by that I mean there's a capacitor coming through and a resistor parallel to them. Like 
if you had two connections, and this is your capacitor and this is just a resistor, they'd be connected like this so that they are in parallel. The one does this, it lets the high frequency through without anything blocking, and then the resistor does some blocking, but not completely. And that's how this amp gets the sound that it does. And I'm almost done. Bar tuning. We'll fire that up again. I don't want to over yank these, but Probably nearest, damn it. Compressor. The compressor is not on. This is like a spinal tap guitar. That's because it has a secret. And it'll sound better once I actually let the strings settle in a bit. Strings want to settle in before I can fine tune it. Let's reveal the secret of this funny little guitar. Just going to take removing six things. We'll put them back on afterwards. It may appear to be a normal Stratocaster copy, but Dun dun! It's got springs, but I filled this in with concrete. No fooling, that's concrete. You can see the rocks in there and stuff. Just ordinary sacrete concrete mix. Did it in a little cup. Sort of clamped it right down against the body there. But then, since I knew this was going to be a hardtail style, Here's what I did. And the, the secret to this is twofold. One, this is not a very heavy sustain block. 
This is a much heavier sustain block, but it's not just that. It also couples the sustain block to the body of the guitar incredibly well. Like, it's a really good physical connection through to the instrument. Now you can't make this go back, as you might well imagine. I think I'd be shocked if anybody thought that they could do something like that and then put it back. That's not going to happen. Anything, if you do that, not only is the bridge permanently attached to the guitar, the guitar is permanently hardtail, and there's just no getting around it. You know, you'd better have your all your ducks in a row as far as what your intentions are for the instrument. But this is not the first guitar that I've done this with. I grew up playing a guitar which was uh, also done in the same way. In fact, it's uh, over there hanging on the wall. So what I'm going to do is just fire this up so that I can do more tuning. my high E note doesn't feel like it has that kind of sustain going on, but... capacitor on there. Then I'll do a little bridge pickup. Yeah, I can't really finger it that way. I don't like it. I like wrapping my hand around like... And you never saw anybody do that, right? And I pick up. And a little noodling around. that I'm shaking around the camera like crazy when I try to vibrato. I have no idea how that's going to work. enough work for today. 
So I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.